For being toy airplanes, there are a lot of controversial topics in this hobby taken a lot more seriously by their audience than flight tests trying to build the biggest of everything. First up, let's look at the myth of tip stalls. Seriously, you can type RC plane into Google and the first thing you'll see will almost always be something tip stall related. This is the largest misconception we've seen in the hobby. I think they're wrong 100%. We tend to have two different types of people in our hobby when it comes to tip stalls. First, you have the average pilot full sending an aircraft to its death by way of a tip stall who doesn't take responsibility for the crash. And second, you have the other guy who's made it abundantly clear that he's a full scale pilot explaining that tip stalls don't exist. Are you serious right now, bruh? Tip stalls are in fact real, but often they're misdiagnosed. Your timber that dropped the wing out from under you likely wasn't a tip stall. It was probably an asymmetric stall. A Hershey bar rectangular wing, such as the timbers, is the least prone to a legit tip stall. Now, if you were flying a swept wing, or sometimes even a delta wing, and stuffed it into the ground after a wing drop the same way that XJet beats FAA regulations into the ground for views, then you'd be correct. You did in fact experience a tip stall. To avoid confusion and never-ending arguments, it's easier just to say you dropped the wing. So, what's the difference between an asymmetric stall and a tip stall? Stay tuned for our upcoming video on everything you can think of related to stalls, including your local airport's bathroom stall. <laughs> Kidding. Next up, let's look at forward pressure. When we mention this to viewers, we're either met with the flight sim experience guy borderline mansplaining to us why we're wrong, or get the airline pilot who's never touched a GA plane since he started his jet job 30 years ago, but his buddy owns a tailwheel. If you're flying a tailwheel aircraft, forward pressure, aka down elevator, is your friend on tail up takeoffs and wheel landings. As with anything in life, too much of anything is a bad thing. Don't be the guy who has to go to his RC mechanic two times in a month because he needs an engine rebuild due to prop strikes. But also, don't be afraid of it. If you want to master tailwheel RC planes on the ground, forward pressure really is your friend. Each tailwheel is different regarding how much forward pressure it needs to be happy, so take your time learning each plane you try this with. Heck, I mean, even the surface you're flying from affects the amount of forward pressure you'll need. Keeping the mains planted during a wheel landing or tail up takeoff makes centerline control a breeze. Without it, you'll look like Will Smith trying to deal with the repercussions of his wife cheating on him multiple times. <laughs> oh, wow. Remember too, you can also throw your prop 90 degrees up and simulate what attitude would give you a prop strike. Anything to help remove the nerves. We have more screenshots of hate comments on Instagram and TikTok than destroyed speakers from Brian Phillips' videos. Can you, can you make that joke the other day? Oh, yeah. No, I, I just I wasn't sure if everybody had um. Head heard. One video that stirred up the most hate was a power off 180 from a simulated engine failure after takeoff with our timber. All right, go ahead and cut it. This is an exercise we strongly suggest doing, as it's great practice. However, some folks commented to never try this under any circumstances in a full scale plane. They're not wrong most of the time, but if you take the time to learn your plane at altitude, you can set a minimum floor for your go, no go turn back to the airport. The same applies to RC. I personally have one friend who's still alive to this day because he lost his engine on takeoff, verified he was above his minimum altitude to turn he'd regularly practiced, and committed to turning back. Here's a quick demo of what my old Luskin was capable of doing. You'll be surprised by the results. We're gonna do that uh, simulated power off 180. I'm gonna set my hard floor as 2500 and see if we can make it. If you have a crosswind, you should start to turn into the crosswind because you'll cover less ground and not get blown away, right? So the wind's coming from this way right now. So there's about 75, here comes 3,000, okay, here's, there's the power loss, I'm going to turn the plane to the right, position for about 65, still at 3,000 feet right here, got some energy, got to bleed off. There's that 180, look at that. Hey. Soli said he knew he couldn't make Teterboro after a dual power plant failure in a $100 million heavier than air flying computer because he eyeballed it. Just saying. That being said, only do what you know to be safe in your given scenario with your current skill set. Not everyone is the almighty savior, solely unable, Solenberger. Technique versus procedure is another concept that the RC and general aviation community looks at with the equivalence of those dumb mobile ads. Don't let yourself think that your tech procedure is the only right way to do something. 
If we were running for president of the aviation community, we'd run our campaign based on the idea that everyone is allowed to fly using their own techniques without being subject to the scrutiny of armchair pilots, engineers, and NTSB investigators. This is because a technique is simply one of many ways to perform any given procedure and should be respected as such. In the airline world, respecting each other's techniques is standard practice, and everyone allows each other to fly the plane the way they want as long as their technique falls within standard operating procedures. Want to fly with auto throttles off? No problem. The same culture should apply to RC. Want to use a ton of expo? Go for it. Want to throw a gyro in anything and everything you fly? By all means, do it. Do what works for you. Our only suggestion is to simply be sure to not allow your technique to limit your ability to grow as a pilot. As an example, use tools such as SAFE as a safety tool while learning to fly. But try not to let it turn you into the kid who brings the security blanket he's used since he was a baby to the college dorm. Eventually, it's good to jump out of the nest without help in order to become a better pilot. Now, let's make a fool of ourselves with our last point on techniques. Pinching versus thumbs. We'd like to call this procedure, but if we're being real, there's no way we can really prove it aside from some anecdotal evidence. We like pinching because we'd like to convince ourselves that there's simply no way you can exert the same control trying to move a stick one millimeter with your thumb alone. Some amazing pilots out there do pinch, but there's also world champion 3D pilots out there that use thumbs, such as Kike Somanzini, so that's just our technique and the rationale behind it. Take it or leave it. Ever met the guy at your RC field who swears by flying balsa planes and constantly hates on foam? So have we. To these pilots, balsa is arguably less prone to hangar rash, tends to look better, generally lasts longer, ever seen a 40-year-old foamy, and can be repaired to good as new condition. We also have seen the flip side where folks only ever buy foam aircraft and never give balsa a fair shot. We personally fly both and have more foam birds than balsa, but that's not for any particular reason. We will say though that sometimes a foamy is just easier to be willing to do stupid stuff like we do with, knowing that you can just hot glue or gorilla glue it back together and be flying again shortly after. Tomato, tomato. Performance is something a lot of folks are insecure about. Take your pick at any joke for this one, but let's tie it to crashing. Crashing doesn't always mean you're bad at flying. It generally means you're flying beyond your skill set. That's a good thing, so long as you don't endanger any persons or property like this dummy did in the Cessna and posted it to TikTok for clout. In RC though, crashing is a means of learning is the fastest way to improve. Don't let your recent crash let yourself believe you're a bad pilot. Instead, think about the ways it'll improve your building skills or how you'll avoid it next time. How else do you think Ben and I become comfortable flying in the middle of the forest? Lots of crashes. We still crash to this day, and we'd be lying if we said we didn't. Speaking of crashing, blaming crashes on the wind or things outside of your control will only lead to more crashes and making you the punchline of jokes. Accept responsibility for your actions, and you'll be surprised at how you can improve. With RC, we're given the gift of being able to walk away from a destroyed aircraft, unlike in full-scale aviation. Learn from it. Figure out how you were at fault, what you can do differently next time, and act on it. Finally, regarding batteries, don't always trust the C rating listed on your packs. Any manufacturer who tries to tell you their battery C rating is above anything more than 45 isn't giving you the true fine print. Check out our friend Joe's from Seattle RC Group's thread that he regularly updates testing almost any brand of RC batteries out there for their true C ratings among other unique data points. We almost exclusively go off his input when making decisions on which batteries to purchase. He redoes the same test with each new batch of batteries that is mass produced. Link in the description. There's a lot of misinformation out there in the world, and specifically within the niche of RC itself. If this video helped clarify some things for you, go ahead and give it a thumbs up, and maybe even consider hitting subscribe. Happy landings, and bounce one on for us. We'll see you next week with a new upload.